Thanks, Dave and Margo. Um, yep, I'm going to give you a quick overview of uh, Sustainable Minds and um, how it works. So you have some context for the project work uh, that Margo and Cindy will subsequently share with you. So Sustainable Minds was the first software company to bring uh, eco design and life cycle assessment software to the market specifically for product development organizations. Uh, we were also the first to deliver that type of software uh, in the cloud. And you can see that we've had um, some very interesting uptake, not only in uh, industry, but also in every type of education uh, around the world. We're a mission-based company. Our mission is to operationalize environmental performance in product development and manufacturing to drive revenue and growth through greener product innovation. And so we're coupling uh, two big ideas, eco-design, teaching people to think differently, or life cycle thinking, coupled with life cycle assessment. Uh, because when you think differently and measure those new ideas, it gets you to truly greener products. And here's where the innovation happens. It's not, it's not through measuring. It's not through doing life cycle assessment. But it's through applying technical and rigorous metrics to new ideas as they happen as quickly or as uh, deeply as they happen uh, to help make trade-offs in early stage product development to ultimately go manufacture better products. Um, just to reemphasize what Dave had already talked about, uh, there are real business drivers today creating real market demand for products with better environmental performance. And so our belief is that it is an innovation driver when you frame product development and manufacturing uh, in a new context, through a new lens, uh, you get new and differentiated solutions. In the software is content and tools that help product development teams, and in this case students, uh, utilize new ways of thinking and bringing new strategies uh, to products throughout their life cycle stage. Cindy will actually illustrate how some of this uh, strategy application uh, stimulates new ideas and new thinking. It also teaches what is life cycle assessment, uh, that it's objective and comprehensive. Uh, it's an iterative process, just like design. And so when you bring uh, iterative measurement into iterative design, uh, it allows you to move through the design and development process in a, in a methodological way. Uh, this is probably the, the geekiest slide in the deck. Because we merged life cycle assessment with engineering, we developed some combined terms. So uh, in Sustainable Minds, you don't just build a bill of materials. You build a system bill of materials because you're accounting for all of the inputs across all the life cycle stages of a product. All of these inputs are expressed in what's called life cycle inventory data or chemical data. And when you attribute the chemical data through the lens of a methodology can be attributed to one or more categories of impact. And each of these types of impact can be attributed to different types of damage, either to human health or to the built or natural environment. Our methodology is based on science from Tracy. Uh, which is developed by the EPA, and it looks at these 10 impact categories. We simplify the life cycle assessment process by creating a single figure methodology. And so we take the impacts from each of these categories, normalize and weight the scores to create a single figure impact factor, which is a millipoint score. We also then pull out the global warming score and interpret that as carbon equivalence so that you can do carbon footprinting. And all of our underlying life cycle inventory data is from the same trusted sources that uh, are used in any other life cycle assessment tool. This is a key concept um, that personally I get quoted a lot as having said this, but um, 
it's, it's really a fundamental concept uh, that you have to start with, which is to debunk the idea that there is any such thing as a green product. There is no such thing. A green is a relative value, and so the only way to determine what's green is by comparison. So something can only be greener than something else. At the core of our software is this comparisons concept tab, where the user starts by benchmarking either an existing product or a first concept, and every subsequent concept or product that gets modeled is compared to this reference. And at any point in time in the product development or investigative process, uh, you can change the reference, and then all of the uh, scores change again uh, as they compare to this baseline. So in fact, uh, Sustainable Minds is not just life cycle assessment software. It's actually eco-concept modeling software with real time life cycle assessment results. And our software is based on these three pillars of software data and collaboration, learning and knowledge management, and community. We knew that just building a, another tool would not make organizations successful. It's about being able to work in new ways, think differently, get the data that you need, learn from each other, collaborate, and share that knowledge both with ins inside your own organization and ultimately externally in a larger community. So again, the software is designed to be able to benchmark and compare. It delivers quantified estimates of environmental performance. It was designed expressly for non-life cycle scientists to integrate into product development. And finally, to create a standardized system so everybody is doing it the same way, the same methodology, the same data, the same way of measuring and ultimately delivering those results in easy to understand uh, formats. Now the learning center that sits alongside the software is quite extensive. Uh, it's maybe today the equivalent of about a 150 page textbook on how to do life cycle assessment, eco design, all the way through uh, results interpretation. I pull out this uh, section about the functional unit and you can see that in any given section, uh, there's lots of examples, lots of definition, um, lots of short case studies. And so there's plenty of content for students to uh, learn on their own, but also plenty of content for you to refer to uh, in assigning uh, homework or reading uh, or research projects. We also, because we're in the cloud, provide the service to develop custom data so that you can model products uh, specific to the way you manufacture products if you're a manufacturer, or as educators if you want to teach with a specific kind of project or product, we can work with you to add the data that you need. And a great example of that was in the last webcast, uh, we featured faculty from the University of Pittsburgh in their chemical engineering program, Eric Beckman, where we worked with Eric to supply the data for the project he gave, which was to redesign a shampoo formulation uh, and a fracking fluid formulation. And so I bring that up because sustainable mines can be used not only for mechanical products, but also for formulated products. And Cindy's going to show you an example of that. Uh, you can browse our data set to see what we have, where the data is from. And again, you can download the data request form and request data as you need it, and we'll work with you to get that added. Now, Sustainable Minds has been used on simple products, complex products, but once again, uh, the process yields more than a finished product. Uh, it yields real learnings that can be reused and amazing insights and amazing results. This is one of my favorite case studies. In fact, you can watch this webcast on our website uh, the redesign of a very simple product, um, this shipping reel, yielded a new product that could be reused 36 times versus an average of two times with the previous design. And one of the key learnings that they reported was that using Sustainable Minds helped them stay focused and on track to a solution that actually provided not just meaningful improvements, but dramatic improvements. And Sustainable Minds 
allowed them to throw out preconceived ideas that they thought would yield great results that in fact uh, didn't uh, yield results at all. This just gives you a sense of what the interface looks like. We're in the System Bill of Materials tab. It's set up to uh, model each stage of the product's life cycle here in the Manufacturing tab. The user starts by setting up all the components that they want to model. We use the terminology of mechanical engineering, assembly, subassembly, and parts. And when you open up uh, each subassembly, you can see that it uh, contains as many parts with processes applied as you like. Uh, the results, again, are comparative. The concept you're working on is always compared to the reference. Uh, and again, the results are easy to use um, and understandable. So Margo, I'm going to turn it back over to you to now talk about how you're using Sustainable Minds um, in your curriculum and what the students and you are learning. Great. Thank you, Terry. So just a few things about me and my background. I joined UC Berkeley in 2011 as a postdoc. I'm currently the Associate Director of the Laboratory for Manufacturing and Sustainability. I'm a research engineer here at the university as well as a lecturer, and I've had the opportunity to work with a number of different organizations, uh, including the Sustainability Consortium and NIST uh, and the California, EP, or the California Air Resources Board uh, in projects related to sustainability. So Professor Dornfeld and I co-teach a course uh, in sustainable manufacturing. It's a graduate course. Uh, we have traditional MS and PhD students in the class as well as MN students and I'll explain their graduate program in a bit more detail later in the presentation. Uh, the goal of our course is for students to understand three things. First, uh, we want them to understand what being sustainable means in for-profit enterprises. Second, uh, we want them to understand how to use the tools and techniques available to support sustainability in a design and manufacturing context. And third, uh, we want them to understand how to communicate sustainability performance to a range of audiences. Uh, the course is divided into nine one to three week segments. Uh, so essentially, these segments fall into three parts. The first is providing students with a broad background in sustainability. The second um, is parts five through eight. There are four segments focused on major sustainability issues, energy, materials, water, and social impacts. And then the final portion of the course focuses on bringing sustainability into the professional practice of design and manufacturing. Currently, uh, we, oh, am I too far ahead? Yes, thank you. Uh, we bring Sustainable Minds into the segment of the course focused on design and manufacturing. Uh, specifically, we use Sustainable Minds to consider how design decisions affect environmental impacts across the product life cycle. So we uh, have the students do a homework assignment using Sustainable Minds. They choose a simple product, uh, develop a reference concept for that product, and analyze the results to understand the impacts and then model at least two alternative designs. So this is the comparison that Terry was just discussing. We ask students to choose a simple product because the focus of this assignment is on understanding life cycle thinking and identifying opportunities to improve the impacts associated with a particular design. As you can see from this excerpt from the grading rubric, we are looking for students to understand how Sustainable Minds works, which will enable them to more critically assess the results it provides, to understand how to set up a life cycle assessment, and to consider several indicators associated uh, with the particular designs and looking at the trade-offs among indicators and designs. Uh, because Sustainable Minds is relatively easy to use, in 10 days the students are able to go from having no prior experience with the software to using the software as a basis for a report on the impacts of a product and a few alternatives, as well as design decisions that are linked to those particular impacts. From our perspective, this is a good fit given all of the other material that we're covering in the course. The students have chosen to examine a number of different products, um, from the very simple, yet very important, pizza box, uh, to the Darfur stove, which is also a very simple product, 
uh, but it provides great benefit to people living in regions uh, that burn bile materials for cooking fuel. Uh, because of this fuel burns, uh, because this particular stove burns the fuel very efficiently, it eliminates much of the particulate that results from conventional stoves and reduces the need to collect fuel. Uh, you can see the other examples of products that students chose listed on the slide. In general, we encourage students to select products with five or fewer components for the assignment. All right. So as an example, oh, thank you, Cindy. The results of the hot glue gun analysis are shown here. The students quickly determined that aluminum was the greatest contributor to the environmental impacts. Uh, their first concept replaced aluminum with steel and included a redesign of the heating element to account for differences in thermal resistance. Their second concept utilized recycled aluminum and included recycling at end of life. And then their third concept utilized recycled steel and the redesigned heating element. Uh, I thought there was two important insights that the students provided in their report. Uh, one was the need to design for disassembly if the steel is to be recycled at end of life. And the second was uh, the importance in changing consumer behavior due to the impacts associated with energy use during the use phase. So certainly the students are uh, gaining an understanding of the impacts of different materials and manufacturing processes, um, but through this exercise, they're able to kind of see a broader picture of the product life cycle. So the students found sustainable mines to be easy to use. Uh, they came away from the assignment with a better understanding of how, to des how design decisions are linked to impacts and how to implement design for environment principles. They also gained experience addressing trade-offs among different considerations. The students also gained broader insights. In one case, the group recognized that a different business model would be necessary for the proposed design to be feasible. And in another case, uh, the milk carton example, the team recognized the importance of regulations. In particular, the FDA's requirement that bottles be made of virgin materials, so recycled components were not an option in that case. As instructors, we learned that the concept of functional unit needs more explanation. Uh, we're currently developing an in-class exercise to ensure that students have every opportunity to understand that concept before we set them loose on the assignment. Uh, we found a number of interesting choices of functional unit that uh, may not have held up to ISO 1440. Um, we also want to provide students with the experience of the data scarcity problem, which they'll likely face in their professional lives. Uh, we want to work on pushing the students to more fully explore how sustainable mind works and to incorporate some of the earlier coursework on eco-design strategies. Okay. So another component of our course is the semester-long project. Um, everyone is in a team of three to five students, and you can see the major milestones of the project here. Uh, in general, we are looking for the students to come out of the project with a report that could easily translate into a conference paper or journal article. Um, so we do require you know, a literature review, an explanation of methodology, um, the impact of the proposed project. Um, based on our philosophy, we also require that the students consider the triple bottom line and look at the life cycle impacts of a product, its system, and the processes involved. There we go. There. Okay. So one example of a semester-long project that incorporated sustainable mines was the soccer ball project. Um, and in this case, the students were comparing uh, the environmental, social, and economic impacts of four different soccer balls. One was just a standard soccer ball. Uh, the second was a fair trade soccer ball. And the third was the socket soccer ball, which I believe it came out of MIT, and the gist of it is that the socket soccer ball generates energy during its use, which is stored in a battery. It has an outlet, um, so the energy that's stored in the ball can be used later to light a lamp or something like that. 
So the students were seeking to quantify the environmental impacts of the soccer ball using sustainable mines and identify which life cycle stages contribute most significantly to environmental performance and identify new designs that would improve that environmental performance. Okay. And so the students found that transportation and end of life are the greatest source of impacts. Transportation because many and or most soccer balls are created in Pakistan and so there's a lot of transportation costs associated with those balls. Um, they found that using recyclable materials would improve the impacts um, by about 45%, which is fantastic. Um, and there was a big difference with the socket soccer ball because of its electrical components. Its biggest impacts were in the manufacturing phase. And so you can see um, the students put together a relatively simple table looking at the trade-offs among the different impact categories for the three different soccer balls. For the environmental impacts, they were virtually the same for the standard and fair trade soccer balls, uh, whereas the socket had lower environmental impacts overall. So the trade-off um, with that fair trade ball is that it has an improved social performance because it addresses uh, worker rights and working condition issues. It does have a slightly lower economic performance than the, fair, the standard soccer, soccer ball. Um, excuse me. And then the socket soccer ball, the economy of uh, that particular product is a little unclear. It's primarily being uh, distributed at no cost to the users, which isn't a great business model, but that may change over time. Okay. So the students recognize that there's different trade-offs uh, for each type of soccer ball. And I thought that one of the insights that came out of their report is this quote shown on the slide. And their goal is not to instruct consumers to make a choice A instead of choice B, but to educate them on the impacts of, just, of their decisions. So to allow consumers to understand that there are many different soccer balls on the market and they, the consumer themselves needs to kind of weigh their values in determining which soccer ball is the right choice. So quickly, I'm going to go through um, a little bit more information about this MNG program we have here at UC Berkeley and how Sustainable Minds was incorporated into some of the capstone projects there. So MNG is a Master's of Engineering program that falls sort of between a traditional Master's of Engineering program and an MBA program. It's looking at developing leadership and technology expertise in these students. And they have a T model curriculum where they attempt to give the students breadth in leadership and business strategy management and so on. Um, but they have depth in some technical area as well as depth developed through a capstone project, which is a project that covers the two semesters the students are engaged in the program. And I'll go very briefly through these learning outcomes. So we're looking to, for the students to integrate uh, business and technical skills to be able to formulate uh, the need that technology might address, identify stakeholders affected by a particular solution, make trade-offs uh, among those stakeholders, develop engineering solutions to the needs that are developed, communicate their solutions to stakeholders, and coordinate a little bit of slide issue here. <laughs> and coordinate a project with uh, team members of diverse backgrounds. So uh, the student group that incorporated Sustainable Minds was working on a project for Siemens, uh, improving the performance of a wind turbine blade. And they were able to add on some triple bottom line assessment through the use of sustainable mines, looking at cost of raw materials, social impacts of toxic metals, and then environmental impacts through the millipoints generated by sustainable mines. And you can see the results of their analysis here in this table where they identified that some particular materials had better economic and environmental impacts than others, 
and some materials had more negative social and environmental impacts. So I think um, in looking at how Sustainable Minds was incorporated in the Capstone project, it was definitely an add-on to their core objectives. And I think that uh, we need to be more careful in how we structure the use of Sustainable Minds to ensure that the students have effective learning opportunities when it's used in this particular context. Um, we want to make sure that the students are able to understand how the software works and do some critical analysis um, and ensure that the students are using correct life cycle thinking and present the results in a meaningful way. Uh, the students in the capstone project I did gain experience with life cycle thinking, um, became more aware of the trade-offs among impacts and began to understand opportunities uh, in design to affect the impacts of manufacturing and the entire product. So I was going to jump in here just to uh, make some um, kind of summary comments about how we incorporate sustainability into manufacturing. <clears throat> a lot of it is definitional. A lot of it is trying to get people to understand how you measure and characterize the functioning of these systems and include the uh, use of materials and resources and then their environmental or their sort of green aspects to it. Uh, usually uh, we have to make sure that we have a comprehensive systems approach. In other words, don't just focus on one particular aspect. One should look at all aspects of it as you go from the, the, uh, the process or the facility on down to the, uh, the tooling. We want to make sure we hit all the, the real requirements for manufacturing, performance, quality, and cost, but also be able to add an element of environmental impact that fits in along with those as just part of the, uh, part of the analysis. So this holistic approach really gets everyone to think about manufacturing in the process life cycle, whether it's for the product to be manufactured or whether for the product that's being used. The, um, did I skip one? Okay, sorry. Um, <clears throat> things like leveraging, uh, that is making the argument that if you do the right thing at the manufacturing phase gives you a tremendous benefit uh, over the range of uh, the operation of the product if manufacturing cannot be seen to be a major impact on the project uh, product life cycle. So that's something that is a great way to tie in fundamentals of engineering, especially manufacturing and design into the, uh, into the analysis uh, as uh, technique. We need to have data-driven tools. Uh, that's something that our lab is working on. That's something that Sustainable Mind certainly offers, but this has to be kind of broadened over the widest range of design and manufacturing. Um, these tools then form a part of a larger framework for sustainability, establishing key performance indices, uh, helping us to define system boundary and scope, uh, how to uh, build tools. We try to uh, prepare students for industry um, because this is an increasing interest of, of uh, companies that hire our students or if students go on to further graduate studies or academics um, as a piece like ethics that needs to be integrated throughout the curriculum. So modules that can be created using tools like sustainability minds and other techniques are very helpful in getting those points across. They are as very effective in engineering practice courses, that is as opposed to say a, a theoretical computation of materials course may not be as effective as in the kind of design courses and manufacturing courses with case studies and projects that we've been, we've been talking about. We're working on integrating this at the undergraduate level because we think that this would really be very beneficial to get students thinking um, we probably would have to have more background material to get them uh, scoped to that and the projects would need to be more structured. Usually in a university environment things trickle down from the research level to the graduate level then to the undergraduate level and that works pretty well and we're sort of now in the trickle phase to the undergraduate, undergraduate curriculum. I think if you're an industry person looking at universities in general that do this or Berkeley in specific, um, we are working on a strategy that ensures that all of our engineering students have an understanding of the sustainability aspects, measurement, impacts, assessment as part of a design and manufacturing curriculum, which is, a, which is important for our accredited program, our ABET accredited program. We have found in our own experience, both at the graduate and undergraduate level, that companies are increasingly interested in hiring folks with this kind of a background. They still want fundamental core engineering skills, but some sensitivity to or awareness of or or competency in life cycle assessment and sustainability thinking is very, is very useful. Um, 
through things like their capstone courses and course project, project students find ways to actually sort of functionally integrate these with their, their normal education, and that's very, uh, that's very good. So I'm going to turn it over to Cindy now, who's uh, got the task of uh, finishing up uh, the discussion today. Thank you, Dave. Okay. Um, so hello, everyone. I just want to say it's a, an honor and a pleasure to be speaking on this webcast today. Currently, I'm a grad student at UC Berkeley, and I conduct research in LMAS with Margot and Dave. And as Terry mentioned earlier, I've also interned with Sustainable Minds for two summers. Oops, sorry about that. All right, so today I'm going to be presenting some ideas for next iteration projects for the course we've been discussing today, Sustainable Manufacturing. And this came about as a result of some early discussions about how to better integrate sustainable minds and also from some of my experiences this summer as an intern. So the big picture of this is that it would be a series of weekly assignments that would have varying levels of complexity and different takeaways for sustainable manufacturing and reveal different trade-offs. And to put this in context, uh, here are the course modules where I see this being most applicable. And as Margot covered today, we currently first introduced Sustainable Minds in that homework assignment where we asked students to model a simple product. And as a next iteration, she mentioned we wanted to include some more exercises around students' understanding of Miller points, make it clear to them that Sustainable Minds uses Tracy methodology, and also ensure that they really have a proper and correct understanding of functional unit. And this is something that I still currently struggle with myself. Um, so I wanted to bring to your attention, oh, I think I'm gonna move. Um, Terry had mentioned the Learning Center, and there's a page devoted to functional unit, and there's some examples, and they're also correlated to product types, and I'd encourage you to direct your students there. And now I'll present a, a sample assignment as it might be integrated into this module for materials in manufacturing. And I've required the students to model a telescopic slide to learn where the impacts are and what's causing them. And I give the students a spreadsheet of instructions and the bill of materials. And they're asked to model a concept with a variety of different materials and given a starting point for different manufacturing processes. And I'd like to note that if whenever you're working in sustainable minds and you don't see the data that you need, that we encourage you to submit the data request form and the team will look to see what's publicly available and if it's there, they'll actually add it for free. Okay. All right. And the goal of this project is to teach students to create proxies and today I'll be providing a specific example of industrial grease for industrial grease and also to understand different trade-offs, whether that's between different materials, different manufacturing processes, and also product lifetime, lifetime and its effect with design and environmental impact. Okay. And here you can see an overview of this telescopic slide. And I should say that this, was, this project was inspired by an experience that I had this summer working with customer support, where there was someone who came to us and um, was modeling exactly this product and had a lot of questions and we felt that this was a great opportunity and exercise for students. And here you can see the different information that they'll need to create the SBOM. Okay. So creating a proxy, um, in this case I'm requiring them to create it for industrial grease. So there's, and I've outlined the two different options. The first is to look what's currently existing in sustainable mines and pick the entry that's most similar. But a second option is to actually dig into the data and model industrial grease given its raw components. And here you can see a generic formulation for grease and also um, each item aligned with what's currently available in sustainable mines. And I feel that this is really a great opportunity and exercise for students because oftentimes they don't really they don't really think about grease as a product and that it has a bomb and it has components to itself. So it, it really is a good chance for them to dig into the data. So here you can see um, the view in the manufacturing stage of what this would look like. And you notice that the icon for industrial grease is different than the others, and that's because it's a sub-assembly and Sustainable Minds has this functionality. And you can treat this as a container that you might mix a recipe within versus the others as specific parts that have only one material in different processes. And this is the results view. So in this case, it's 
showing us that material selection, specifically the choice of steel, is contributing greatest in this life cycle to its impact and would then be the focus of redesigns. Um, so here are some questions that you could pose to students. So how can they reduce the impacts of material use? How does material selection and product lifetime interrelate? And then given different scenarios about use or product lifetime, how would it be designed differently? And this would also be a great opportunity to redirect them to the, the Learning Center and the Eco-Design Strategy Wheel and examine lower impact materials. And this is a, a snapshot of what this concept um, looks like compared to some of the alternatives and you'll see that they're benchmarked to the reference and there's a variety of different materials and the functionality to point out here is the copy concept functionality and which makes building this project really easy when you only change a little bit about each concept. Okay. And so that concludes the specific example um, but this is a list of some others that I came up with while I was working on this creating scenarios or doing comparing to market competitors doing a comparative problem, trying to answer which is better, the questions which is better, paper versus plastic. And just to wrap up, I want to introduce the Sustainable Minds Curriculum Library, and this is um, a collection of examples of syllabuses and, student, uh, and assignments for students, and we've been collecting these for about a year now, so if um, you feel that these would be helpful for you, please let us know and we can send you some. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Cindy. That was um, a great summary, and we miss you already. <laughs> um, and so, again, to wrap up, I think Dave and Margo and, and Cindy have done a great job to show uh, that the skills that are now required to teach uh, engineers and designers uh, to get good jobs, ultimately, in uh, in the marketplace need to be taught in, in school now and uh, it means that educators are continually uh, creating new types of courses or new types of projects using new kinds of tools um, and it's also important to um, recognize and I think this is a great example that everybody is figuring this out right now you know Dave, Margo, Cindy continually trying things, iterating, learning new stuff. Um, as the market needs increase, uh, the response in education uh, needs to step up uh, to meet that demand. To wrap up, uh, we want Sustainable Minds ultimately to be used in every school, in all types of curriculum. We make it very easy to get started. You can get a free trial. You can purchase from the site. We have quantity discount programs for class sizes, departments, even site-wide programs. We have special support and training packages for education. Uh, we can help you create a course, a project, create custom data. And we invite you to visit our blog uh, where we have the webcast replays and pretty extensive uh, write-ups of each of the webcasts that we've had to date featuring educators from business design and engineering who have been teaching with Sustainable Minds and have done the same thing that you saw Margo present today, talk about uh, their school, the course, the project, show examples and the learnings uh, acquired by the students and by the educators. And this webcast will also be uh, posted on our blog along with a write-up and for those of you who are interested in uh, getting this slide deck, we're happy to send it to you. I think you can indicate that there's uh, some questions on the exit. Uh, when you exit the webcast, uh, you can respond, let us know. Uh, if you'd like the deck, uh, we'll follow up with some of you who have indicated uh, that you'd like us to do that. And um, in the couple minutes, uh, we are at the top of the hour, but um, for those of you who have a few minutes to still hang out, um, we'll try to respond to some of the questions that have been submitted. And again, for those that we don't get to, we'll follow up with you offline and, and uh, 
address your questions there. Um, so the first question, um, Dave, was directed to you, uh, and this was before Margot and Cindy showed their work, but particularly uh, was interested in design projects uh, that focus on maximizing options for material reuse and recycling of used materials at the end of life. Is there any particular focus on, on those types of projects? Um, it's a great question. So there is, and it kind of breaks down into a couple of categories. So category number one is, are you going to be taking something apart and then trying to recover materials for uh, recycling or uh, you know, resmelting or uh, returning back to some uh, newer or, or as part of a mix in a newer, newer product. There's a second category, which is essentially taking things apart as you would be if you were recycling electronics and trying to harvest some of the materials to be used straight off. There's a third category, and I was just, we were just at a conference in Copenhagen where it was a great presentation, where you take something apart and you use the material not as the input to a sort of a resmelting and reformulating process, but you use the material as the input to another stage of a, of a manufacturing process that gives you an output um, that uses that material as the input. For example, if you take a, a fender off of an automobile, could you in fact extract enough flat material from that, either using a hydrostatic forbing or some kind of a forging process to create another metallic component that could go back on the automobile without having to go through the entire recycling process, that is the smelting and the casting and the re-rolling and the, and the stamping, etc. So we look at kind of three different categories of that. Uh, some of them are, are basically, if you, there's something called the RICO Comet Circle, which you're, some of the listeners may be familiar with. If you, if you Google R-I-C-O-H Comet Circle, you'll, it'll pop right up, where they talk about different paths. And the, the idea is to try to get the path back to a successful reuse with the least amount of, of material processing, transportation, handling. So yeah, I think the, the idea of reusing materials or recycling materials, other than just sort of shredding it and throwing it, blowing it into a, a furnace someplace, uh, is very important. And this reflects the design functionality. Margot mentioned some cases where there are restrictions because of FDA and you can't put things in other things for different kinds of product or uh, reflects the manufacturing technology that might take materials that have been previously used and repurpose them without going through a, a, a back to, you know, back to the, back to the ore uh, recycling process. Thanks, Dave. Um, there was another question that was directed to you. Um, a, a statement and a question. Um, are you aware of the four pillars model of manufacturing knowledge that was introduced in the SME white paper Workforce Imperative in September of 2012? And if you are aware of it, have you integrated it into your sustainability curriculum? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> Very simple. I am aware of it. Um, the way you integrate things like that into your curriculum is, is to sort of compose modules or components or topics in lectures that reflect those. I would say we're probably structuring that. This is the, essentially the third time that we've, we're going to be teaching the course the third time this spring. And we're looking at how to structure it in a way that makes both intellectual sense uh, to the students, gives them a right balance of computational and uh, practical training and then also adds these other components to it. So I think it's a great suggestion. Uh, I would certainly uh, encourage anyone to take a look at that, and we are in the process of doing it. I don't have any good examples of how we've, how we've done that so far, however. Okay, the next question is, is a really good one, and I'm glad um, it was posed. Um, and the question is, how do you see industrial designers working with engineers especially when both are using a life cycle assessment methodology? Um, so I, I can make a little comment that I would, would let uh, either Margo or, or Cindy. I think, you know, there's always this discussion about, you know, 80% of the cost of a product is instituted in the, or, or, or cemented in during the design phase, and then it's kind of manufacturing, it's just sort of an add-on. That's always bothered me because it sort of makes manufacturing look rather trivial. 
I think what's really happening, and we talked to some folks from Samsung, a former student of mine, who sort of talks about design for manufacturing, manufacturing for design, where there's actually a much more integrated uh, discussion, iteration loop between design and manufacturing. And if you think about some of these software tools that allow you to sort of look from design towards manufacturing, predict problems, or at least um, anticipate problems that you're going to have, and going from this the you know manufacturing characteristic or or feature to a to product functionality, but also to look at back up that 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 tube from the manufacturing perspective and say what is it that the designer could have done that would make my life simpler, I think that's where the discussion has to be, and a lot of this is to integrate the very conceptual aspects of industrial design, where you're really trying to create something that has a certain functionality and excitement to the to meet a need for the consumer to the practical, more nitty-gritty aspects of actually turning it into a, to a real product. I mean, I'm going to turn it over to, to Cindy or, or Margo. Both of them have worked in this area, uh, Cindy especially, and maybe she has some follow-on comments. So uh, just to add on to what David said, this is Margo. And I see it being a little bit iterative, and I also see it as being dependent on how the organization is structured. And I have a pretty strong quality engineering background, and there's a at one point, quality was someone's job, and they, there was one person who was responsible for it. Um, and there was a shift in thinking that quality needed to be integrated into everyone's work. And I think this is similar, um, that sustainability needs to be everyone's job. And in many cases, that means you know, teams of employees with diverse backgrounds. So certainly, the industrial designers need to be working with the manufacturers, as Dave, sa as Dave said, to both design for manufacturing and to manufacture for design, to ensure that you have the manufacturing capability to implement the design as conceived. And just to chime in quickly, I think um, in taking this into the classroom too, it's also a, a good opportunity to, to try to mix multidisciplinary teams, and that can re lead to good learnings, And because different people have different priorities for design. So it's good to get them all working on, on a same goal. Yeah, just to jump in on, um, on that comment, Margo and Cindy, we've taught um, an untold number of workshops, both on-site at a manufacturer as well as um, open uh, public workshops. And um, without exception, uh, the teams who work on a project that are comprised of both designers and engineers uh, develop you know, the best, the most innovative solutions because uh, everybody is uh, ideating and collaborating at the same time. And so uh, there's business model ideas, there's functional ideas, there's new use ideas. And when, the, when those ideas are being developed and contributed by all the people involved and all the different uh, perspectives that need to be brought into new product development. That's when innovation really happens. And I think there's a, you know, again, going back to the shipping reel project that I showed you earlier, uh, that was a great example of truly multidisciplinary uh, team and approach uh, that was able to uh, rethink uh, and move a product forward um, really in, in exponential steps rather than just incremental. And I would even go one step further, which is to say that when there's not an industrial designer or designer present in early stage product development, uh, the more radical kinds of uh, ideas uh, don't get considered. Um, so uh, we highly encourage um, multidisciplinary teams, interdisciplinary courses, and um, and I think that's an exciting idea to uh, close this webcast with today. Um, I want to thank Dave, Margo, and Cindy for taking the time uh, to be with us today and to have put the effort into putting this presentation together. Um, I learned a lot, and I hope you did too. Some of the parting comments of folks uh, who have uh, dropped off already. Um, have confirmed that. Great webcast, learned a lot, and I hope 
all of you who have uh, stayed on past the hour, we appreciate that, and I hope you've enjoyed uh, what you've learned and, and that you've also learned a lot and are interested and excited to take what you learned into your, into your schools and into your businesses. And with that, uh, thanks again, Dave, Margo, and Cindy, and that wraps up our webcast for today. Our pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks.